Well, good day to you all, dear ones, and welcome to this 19th day of September. It is day 263 in our journey through the Bible. Now, I make it a point of calling you dear ones, and I hope that it is not lost on you because that, my friend, is what you in fact are. You are dear to God, to his heart. You are his workmanship. That's what Paul calls you in the book of Ephesians. You are his poema, his poem. Your very being, the source of your very life, is rooted in the God who is love. You are dear. So let that sit in, will you? And today we're going to sit in the scriptures. And today it's in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 47 and 48. And then we'll finish our reading in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. I'm glad you're here. Ezekiel, chapter 47. In my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on its south side. The man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway and led me around to the eastern entrance. There I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gateway. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream for 1,750 feet and then led me across. The water was up to my ankles. He measured off another 1,750 feet and led me across again. This time the water was up to my knees. After another 1,750 feet, it was up to my waist. Then he measured another 1,750 feet, and the river was too deep to walk across. It was deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. He asked me, Have you been watching, son of man? Then he led me back along the river bank. When I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. Then he said to me, This river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. The waters of this stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. There will be swarms of living things wherever the water of this river flows. Fish will abound in the Dead Sea, for its waters will become fresh. Life will flourish wherever this water flows. Fishermen will stand along the shores of the Dead Sea, all the way from En Gedi to En Aglaim. The shores will be covered with nets drying in the sun. Fish of every kind will fill the Dead Sea, just as they fill the Mediterranean. But the marshes and swamps will not be purified. They will still be salty. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow along both sides of the river. The leaves of this tree will never turn brown and fall and there will always be fruit on their branches. There will be a new crop every month, for they are watered by the river flowing through the temple. The fruit will be for food and the leaves for healing. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Divide the land in this way for the twelve tribes of Israel. The descendants of Joseph will be given two shares of land. Otherwise, each tribe will receive an equal share. I took a solemn oath and swore that I would give this land to your ancestors, and it will come to you as your possession. These are the boundaries of the land. The northern border will run for the Mediterranean toward Hethlan, then on through Lebohamath to Zedad. Then it will run to Borathan and Sabraim, which are at the border between Damascus and Hamath, and finally to hezor Hitikon, on the border of Huran. So the northern border will run from the Mediterranean to hezor Enan on the border between Hamath to the north and Damascus to the south. The eastern border starts at the point between Haran and Damascus and runs south along the Jordan River between Israel and Gilead, past the Dead Sea as far south as Tamar. This will be the eastern border. The southern border will go west from Tamar to the waters of Meribah at Kadesh and then follow the course of the Brook of Egypt to the Mediterranean. This will be the southern border. On the west side, the Mediterranean itself will be your border from the southern border to the point where the northern border begins, opposite Lebohamath. 
Divide the land within these boundaries among the tribes of Israel. Distribute the land as an allotment for yourselves and for the foreigners who have joined you and are raising their families among you. They will be like native-born Israelites to you and will receive an allotment among the tribes. These foreigners are to be given land within the territory of the tribe with whom they now live. I, the Lord, have spoken. Ezekiel 48 Here's the list of the tribes of Israel and the territory each is to receive. The territory of Dan is in the extreme north. Its boundary line follows the Hethlon road to Lebohamath and then runs on to Hezar Enan on the border of Damascus. With Hamath to the north, Dan's territory extends all the way across the land of Israel from east to west. Asher's territory lies south of Dan's and also extends from east to west. Naphtali's land lies south of Asher's, also extending from east to west. Then comes Manasseh, south of Naphtali, and its territory also extends from east to west. South of Manasseh is Ephraim, and then Reuben, and then Judah, all of whose boundaries extend from east to west. South of Judah is the land set aside for a special purpose. It will be eight and one-third miles wide and will extend as far east and west as the tribal territories, with the temple at the center. The area set aside for the Lord's temple will be eight and one-third mile long and six and two-third miles wide. For the priest, there will be a strip of land measuring eight and a third miles long by three and one-third miles wide, with the Lord's temple at the center. This area is set aside for the ordained priest, the descendants of Zadok, who served me faithfully, and who did not go astray with the people of Israel and the rest of the Levites. It will be their special portion when the land is distributed, the most sacred land of all. Next to the priest's territory will lie the land where the other Levites will live. The land allotted to the Levites will be the same size and shape as that belonging to the priests, eight and one-third miles long and three and one-third miles wide. Together these portions of land will measure eight and a third mile long and six and two-third miles wide. None of this special land may ever be sold or traded or used by others, for it belongs to the Lord. It is set apart as holy. An additional strip of land, eight and a third miles long, by one and two-third miles wide, south of the sacred temple area, will be allotted for public use, homes, pasture lands, and common lands, with the city at the center. The city will measure one and a half miles on each side, north, south, east, and west. Open lands will surround the city for 150 yards in every direction. Outside the city, there will be a farming area that stretches three and a third miles to the east and three and a third miles to the west along the border of the sacred area. This farmland will produce food for the people working in the city. Those who come from the various tribes to work in the city may farm it. This entire area, including the sacred lands and the city, is a square that measures eight and a third miles on each side. The areas that remain to the east and to the west of the sacred lands of the city will belong to the prince. Each of these areas will be eight and one third miles wide, extending in opposite directions to the eastern and western borders of Israel, with the sacred lands and the sanctuary of the temple in the center. So the prince's land will include everything between the territories allotted to Judah and Benjamin, except for the areas set aside for the sacred lands and the city. These are the territories allotted to the rest of the tribes. Benjamin's territory lies just south of the prince's land, and it extends across the entire land of Israel from east to west. South of Benjamin's territory lies that of Simeon, also extending across the land from east to west. Next, the territory of Issachar, with the same eastern and western boundaries. Then comes the territory of Zebulun, which also extends across the land from east to west. The territory of Gad is just south of Zebulun, with the same borders to the east and west. The southern border of Gad runs from Tamar to the waters of Meribah at Kadesh, and then follows the brook of Egypt to the Mediterranean. These are the allotments that will be set aside for each tribe's exclusive possession. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. These will be the exits to the city. On the north wall, which is one and a half miles long, there will be three gates, each one named after a tribe of Israel. The first will be named for Reuben, the second for Judah, and the third for Levi. On the east wall, also one and a half miles long, the gates will be named for Joseph, Benjamin, and Dan. The south wall, also one and a half miles long, will have gates named for Simeon, Issachar, and Zebulun. 
And on the west wall, also one and a half miles long, the gates will be named for Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. The distance around the entire city will be six miles, and from that day, the name of the city will be The Lord is There. Luke chapter 2. At that time, the Roman emperor, Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census, and because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby, lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering. As required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child, so his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's firstborn child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifices required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is the light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Anna a prophet was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84, 
She never left the temple, but always stayed there day and night, worshipping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom and God's favor was on him. Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first, because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious leaders, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them, and his mother stored up all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. And now may our Lord Jesus give his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Stored away. Luke tells us that she, Mary, stored it away in her heart. The fear, the promise, the questions, the disappointments, and did I say fear? She didn't explain it away. She didn't deny it or impose her will upon it. She simply stored it away in faith, resting and trusting that God's purposes would be fulfilled and that she was seen and known and loved. So amidst all these mysteries, she stores it away. All these memories, all these things that people were saying, believing that God's word would not fail. Mary was simply a willing vessel for God. She stored it all up in her heart. When the shepherds came and sought her out in her makeshift lodgings, they came to tell her about the angels and the angel choir and the declaration that this child was the one they were all waiting for. She tucked that away like you would store away food or money for a long journey. She was planning ahead. And when she took Jesus to the temple and the two prophets, Simeon and Anna, spoke over this child and over them, she stored that away. She was told her child would be a sign from God and that many would oppose him. The prophets told her that the deepest thoughts of many hearts would be revealed because of this child and a sword would pierce her very own soul. All this she stored away. She knew these things would mean something to her in the days ahead. But on that day, she didn't know. When Jesus was 12 years old, he stayed behind in the temple for three days without his parents knowing where he was, teaching the teachers and insisting that he had to be in his father's house. Mary couldn't make sense of this, but she stored it away in her heart. This was not a problem to be solved. This was a mystery to be revealed. She was trusting that God had her heart and had seen her and favored her and loved her. And she believed that in time, his time, God's heart and his purposes for her and this son and the shepherds and Simeon and Anna and all the people in all creation would be made known. It would become crystal clear. The good news for all, as the angel said, would be revealed. 
So let me ask you, what are you storing in your heart? Do you know, like Mary, that God has seen you, known you, favored you, loved you? Are you willing to let God be God in you? If you are and if you do, you'll begin to store up things in your heart. They might be life's pains, unfulfilled promises, stored away. You're not running from them. You're not trying to solve them. You're not trying to explain it away. You're not trying to impose your own agenda upon it. You're simply storing it away in your heart, waiting for the mystery of it all to be revealed. You're resting in faith, trusting that God has got this. So today, let me tell you that you are known, that you are seen, you are loved. Store that away in the midst of all that you're going through, all the loss, all the confusion, all the uncertainties. Store these things away, like Mary, in your heart. You, like Mary, be a vessel, a servant waiting with anticipation in faith to see what God will do. Be available to him today. Be resting and willing today, trusting. That's the prayer that I have for my own soul. That's the prayer that I have for my family, for my wife, my daughters, my son. And that's a prayer that I have for you. May it be so. And now, let us pray. Lord God Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we might not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear Lord, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit on all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that I might not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, in the pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in the dying that we are born unto eternal life. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your grateful children, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and all you have made. We bless you for your creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, and above all, for your immeasurable love and your redemption of the world through our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. Lord, we pray, give us such awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but with our lives, by the giving up of ourselves for your service in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory through all ages. Amen. And now as our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, hey, 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 DRB family, I hope that you're doing well out there. I hope that you are holding up. I hope that you are healthy. I hope that this week is shaping up real nice for you. Well, hey, I wanted to report back to you some information about our little excursion to go see the Swifts, the Vox Swifts. I think that's what they're called. A migratory bird that shows up here in this part of the world in the month of September, early October. And these amazing birds, they have a place that they prefer to roost for the night in an old elementary school chimney. And literally, there were probably uh, over a thousand people that had congregated in the playground of that old elementary school. Right about sunset, kids were playing. Uh, Families were just taken in the moment, and it was just a great time to see birds. (laughs) Birds that showed up about sunset and... There, in a bit of a flurry, they make this kind of tornado-like formation as they quickly descend into the chimney for the night. And when that happens, when the last bird makes that last little swirl, the whole crowd erupts in applause. Cheers are echoing off the school building. It's just... An incredible time to see people cheering the birds as they go to bed for the night. Creation is such an amazing thing, isn't it? There's so much wonder to behold. There is awe all around us. May God give us eyes to see it. And when you see it, maybe you can give a silent cheer. <laughs> Or maybe not be silent about it. Maybe just applaud. Maybe just say thank you to the God who makes such wonders. Hey friend, we live in a world of miracles and wonders amidst all of life's pains, losses, and challenges. It's all a part of this crazy mix, isn't it? And I want to let you know that there is hope, my friend. We have hope to carry on. I was listening just last night about a story of a, a person who just felt like they were stuck, in part because of their age. They thought, you know, I'm 50 years old. I'm just kind of stuck in this occupation that I do not like. And, well... I just want to let you all know that age isn't necessarily a barrier and that you can make changes no matter how old you might think you are. If you're feeling stuck, let me encourage you to take that stuckness to the Lord. You let him talk to you. You let him inspire you with awe. You let him open up your eyes to see what's real around you and give you hope again to bring to life something within you that has been dormant for a long time. Because 50, my friend, is not too late. Well, hey, 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 I don't know why I went off on all that, but let me just say I am so grateful that here in my late 50s, I am so honored and privileged to share time with you each day, to be inspired by you, to be encouraged by you. I just want to applaud y'all like the birds there in that elementary school chimney. Just applaud the fact that, that you are God's beloved, that you are his amazing creation, 
you are his child and you are loved. And that, my friend, is such an awesome thing. Well, hey, what do you say we show up again here tomorrow and do this again? That's my plan. Lord willing and the creek don't rise, your brother Hunter plans on being here. Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this, that you are loved. No doubt about it. All righty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.